Hello, it works. Good evening, everybody. Good evening uh, to those here at home, to my favorite fan, very especially, and to those watching at home, uh, from home. Uh, thanks very much for joining. Thank you very much, all of those who are still in the exhibition. Uh, I invite you still to join. Um, it is a pleasure for not only for me but for, for the whole team to have been able to uh, open partially uh, this exhibition uh, this exhibition tonight. I just want to basically uh, thank everybody that has participated. It was not a, an easy ride. Our idea was as Dick was explaining in the beginning was to have this kind of cloud or installation out of art no? this is what we uh, meant uh, to have ready tonight and together very closely with uh, uh, Lex, uh, Robin, I don't, yeah, Robin is there, and then Max joined uh, later. 
we have been trying to put this together. No? It's been not an easy ride, but a very interesting one for us, uh, trying to, uh, let's say, improve the way we do the exhibitions at the, uh, at the, uh, at the, um, at the faculty. Uh, students, faculty participated, we started receiving material, and first of all, more than the material, we were more worried about how do we make people, or sorry, make people be safe in a place where things are hanging. No, it's not been easy, but we have been trying little by little. Uh, Lex made a great effort. Thank you very much again, because without them, uh, I, mean, I know this is something easy to say many times, but without the work that they did, we wouldn't be able to, to do this. No? I also want to thank to all those that have participated. I'm sorry that the credits are not in the room. They will come. So we have this long list of participants. All their work is there uh, hanging from the ceiling or will be there hanging from the ceiling when the installation is finally totally completed. No? Then we received the works and uh, we started deciding how to place them, in what location, etc., etc. So I had my fun time making these kind of elevations and playing with my puzzle, really nicely prepared for the others, and I could yeah, nicely play around with works of art from all of you. Uh, we are testing how to show the credits, how to show all this information that you sent us, so it will be there on the walls uh, very, very soon, I would say, not later than, than next week. So I would also like to thank IKEA Systems because they are cheap and they have allowed us to, to work. So thanks to IKEA at the same time. They are not a sponsor in us, but maybe they should. Uh, it's, been, uh, yeah, it's been quite, quite a ride, many hours uh, trying to, to do all this. But finally, uh, we, have, we have all this, this, work, uh, this work here, no? this work here done. These are images that I received in WhatsApp last night when I was having dinner and I uh, was really Really happy to see what was going on. So I know this is a little bit of a team, uh, how to say, team building moment, but we also deserve it. It's been a lot of work. So thanks very much again to all of you. This I found this morning when I came uh, to the faculty. And now what was also really, really nice is to see the participants and the walkers by in the OCR uh, very happy with what was happening. So uh, I think we are all quite satisfied and then we, we need to improve many things but they will come in the coming weeks and probably in the coming years we will do better and better exhibitions and we'll end up covering the space you know, uh, this way. I didn't mention that Bas is essential. Uh, his work was really important for the, uh, well, to make this happen. So it's all, it's all there. So with that, I just want to say that the exhibition will be on until the 26th of January next year. And, uh, uh, it's meant to be, besides an installation in which we had a lot of fun and a lot of effort, it's meant to be a reflection about the role of art uh, in the built environment. No? What is, does art mean for the city? What does art mean for the citizens? And then, in a parallel, let's say, line of thought, uh, how do we integrate the appreciation of art, if I may say, into the faculty's curriculum? How we can make, it, uh, how we can make uh, students be uh, say, more informed and more sensitive about art. Uh, talking to uh, several people in the last couple of weeks, one once has the impression that maybe the T of T UDEL is very big, technical solutions for the problems coming or the challenges of the future. But I wonder if we are not forgetting art or the appreciation of art. Um, I am an architect by formation, but I also studied art history, and I find it essential that art is included in the in, the, in, in design education in many, many, many ways. Anyway, it's coming, it's happening, and it's, we are gonna have a panel talking about it, uh, about it tonight. I'm gonna give the word immediately to Peter, Peter Kostra, he will be the moderator of the session. I also welcome Maurice, Mariken, Johannes, and Sarah for being here. Hein in the last minute couldn't make it because of that, that virus that is actually still there and is still among us. Um, so with further ado, with no further ado, I will give the word to Peter. He will introduce properly everyone and run the discussion. I hope that you talk a lot. I hope that you disagree a lot and uh, give us your take on this. Thank you very much. The, word, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Uh, art and the built environment, art in the city it's called. Uh, some people say art is a necessity uh, in our society. Uh, it's a necessity in the public environment. Other ones said it's a waste of money. Uh, you can 
put your money better in another place. So there must be something in between. If we ask uh, architects, architects consider themselves as uh, uh, architects as the mother of all arts. But if we ask the average architect what he knows about his children or her children, you hardly get an answer. They know very little about it. And uh, I think that's one of the things that we notice in uh, this education, that, uh, as Javier mentioned, the T of technology is, is very important. Uh, it's, uh, that's a necessity in the education. But it cannot be there without the P of poetry. Uh, I think that's an important part as well. And um, that's why I'm a little bit curious about the opinions of, uh, of my colleagues. What is the meaning of art in that built environment? Why should we do that? Why should we do it? Uh, you ask me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that's an easy question with a lot of answers, I think. Um, well, I think it's, at the core, it's imagination, I think, is something we need. And especially in a society that is built for, um, yeah, like an economic uh, way of um, trespassing or going through this architectural uh, environment. And I think ways to uh, experience it in a different way, to halt or to pause or to just stand and wonder. And that might be caused by a piece of art or... Um, or maybe even just by uh, your own fantasy or thought. I think that's, uh, yeah, it's important to, to enter another uh, domain or another dimension. And in, in, in that sense, what's the difference then between things that we realize in the built environment or that we do in a museum? Has it the same role? Um, I don't know. It depends because if I think... Uh, if, if a piece of art is uh, made for a specific site, if it's site-specific, um, yeah, it might trigger something else, then especially you, you, you will reach another audience, like a passerby or just the public in, in public space. Uh, a museum is always, you need to go there, buy a ticket, and enter the white cube, as to say. So there is already like this threshold for uh, a lot of people to, to get um, in contact with uh, art. So maybe that's already a, another reason to, to bring art outside into the public space, or let's call it public space or outside in architecture, yeah. Whatever you call it. How do you think about that? Uh, well, I mean, should there be art in public space? Of course, it's a matter of life and death. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not just uh, an extra, yeah? but I think public space is the space that belongs to all of us. It's in a sense, well, it should be a democratic space uh, that all people can enter, all people can see. You can go without a ticket and a museum is something uh, totally different, yeah? something entirely different. So yes, we need art in public space. I'm not so sure though about architecture claiming to be the mother of art. I, I have my thoughts on That's that. That's what the architects are always telling me. <laughs> exactly, but who is, who is telling you this? It's the architects. Eh? And there, there's something about people boasting about their children. It's uh, now I just, I'm just became a mom, so I'm, I'm very weary of the boasting about your children. But I think, I think uh, art is something we all know. I don't think it's this magical secret society Illuminati thing. I think it's something we all know. As a child, we start to play with things. Uh, we have imagination, like, like you rightly said. Uh, and part of architecture is artistic. And perhaps the difference is that art can be autonomous. So a, a building usually has, an, uh, has people who need to live in it or use it in some manner. And uh, most art doesn't have any other functionality than, than itself, just being art. Yeah, I'm afraid that I agree. Um, but I also think that there's like a lot of different art. Like I said, that there's like a lot of variation and uh, that is also good to have as many different kind of art that find its place. Uh, 
in a city, in a public environment, so that you also yeah, get confronted at it at the moment that you are not looking for it, which makes it actually even better. And also like what you said about the white cube, that it sort of claims to be like a natural space, uh, a neutral space, which it obviously isn't. It's also already like, um, it is also in a way site specific already, but then sort of, yeah, with a claim of neutrality. Um, by the way, about architecture, I agree, because I was somewhere reading or talking to somebody and they said, yeah, architecture, there's just four walls. That's sort of like architecture to the core. So in a sense, if the mother of all art, no, definitely not. It's uh, a, <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> Although there is a lot of uh, uh, relationships between art and architect, because like I, for some reason I end up uh, I go more to the architecture biennale in Venice than I go to the art biennale in Venice. And then you see also the, so there's a lot of cross happening, uh, cross contamination happening, which uh, I much appreciate. Well, in, in the past there's always been an important role of art within architecture, of course, and, and uh, uh, if we look at, at uh, the work in the, in the churches, for example, where we have these beautiful stained glass windows, uh, the, 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 the sculptures of, of uh, the, the Madonnas or whatever, uh, that, gave us, that was also a part of the art. And art was more or less, in that sense, integrated within the role of the architecture uh, as a kind of extra uh, it was layer. Co it was commissioned, I think. It was commissioned. Yeah. It was commissioned. And... Uh, Probably that's, that's something different than we have nowadays, because isn't it so that if, if we compare what you, what you were saying, art is on itself and people need it, when we go to a museum, we choose for the confrontation of art. When we're in public space, we're not choosing it, we're just confronted with it. And does that have any meaning for art? Does that mean that we have to do something different up there? Or can we do exactly the, the extremities that we do in the museum? Can we do that in the public space? How do you look at that, Klein? No, I think that uh, the biggest difference if you go to a museum, you know that it's a temporary show, right? It doesn't last forever. And I think most people are very offended if they see art in public space. They think that's forever. Right? But I mean, it's the same with the building. If you would start wondering about every building that you see, it is there forever, right? Your life would be quite miserable, right? <laughs> right? I mean, there's, there's good art and there's bad art. There's a lot of bad art and there's a lot of bad architecture. And I think the bad architecture is not missing art at all. It simply doesn't think about it. No? Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. There's architecture that we would like to disappear as soon as possible. Uh, it, it, it has a little bit longer lifespan most of the time. But, maybe but a lot of art disappears as well. During I, think may, I think maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. You know? I think what I really, what the difference to me would be, and then uh, I don't know, Marie, can how about you, but architecture is much more social than art is. Mm -hmm. Art is not a very social uh, no? occupation. Well, depending on the kind of art you make, I think. Or you create. Do you, do you mean the making process itself? That's very solitary. But but and, and the whole idea that, uh, that every artist wants to be an author, right? So the, the idea of the collective in art is rare. Mm -hmm. it is, it's, it's starting to, to play up more. But in the history of art, the idea of the collective is zero, yeah. right? And I think in, in architecture, the idea alone that there is a user, right, of the building, right, that there are needs of the user, inhabitant, however you want to put it, that is a major difference. Right? There's, there's, there's a different sort of social scope with the architecture than with the art. Yeah, I, I doubt if that's true. Yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of uh, ancient cultures where art was practiced collectively without any authorship. For instance, the caves of Lascaux, eh, one of the first examples. I don't, I don't think people signed their work there. But that's very ancient. I think, I think true, the word art I, I, didn't yeah. exist then. Well, that's a, discussion, that's a discussion we could have. I, I think it did. And I think the, the authorship is something that's really part of, uh, of a certain period in art. I totally agree, but I mean, on, on the other end, you know, at a certain moment, art became uh, uh, 
became so powerful as it is now, at least to me as an artist, because you could study it, you know, it could be taught, you could be successful in it, you know, it, had, it, it, it became, it, it got its own life, right? And that's related to the 20th century, 19th century maybe, but that it became achievable for everyone. Well, in the making as well. Everybody could be an artist. That was new. That's true. But if you talk about authorship, I, I w was trained as an architect. I studied in Delft. I worked as an uh, architect for about, well, six years. I saw some pretty large egos in the, in the offices that I happened to work. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't call them anonymously, collectively operating, you know, benign uh, beings. Not all of them, at least. So <coughs> that has to do with uh, the... the, 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 the tendency to be famous. Architects want to be famous, they want his name on the building, at the building. Uh, does artists have the same thing? I mean, if you work in the public space, most of the time your work is quite anonymous. There's never, uh, hardly ever is, is there a name underneath it. Title is never, not always mentioned. So there's, there, there, there is a difference between a museum in that sense. And that also means that, probably it means that the role uh, and, and the meaning for society is different. Why, again, why do we need art in the public space if there isn't a question? I, I think really if you ask people, do you want art? Uh, if you ask that for the public, uh, and quite a lot of them will say, what do we, what do we need? We need a, a, a garden, we need uh, whatever. Cars. Is something functionally. <laughs> but we don't need art. If you Yeah, but I think it's not, Oh, I, I don't believe in this democratic uh, idea about uh, uh, asking people whether uh, they want art or not. I think we really have to just put it there and, um, and uh, conf yeah, maybe you say confront, but I think also buildings can be confronting and uh, there, c there can be a lot confronting. But I think it's important to, um, yeah, it can be a statement or it can be a... Um, uh, a sweet gesture or it can be something maybe very ugly but I think it's good that there are things in in public space that you are confronted with that maybe are not so aimable or or nice or or wanted but I think exactly that is interesting that it might give you a thought about yeah why why it would be there for you or um, I think people need to think for themselves also, in that sense. Does it make sense what I say? Yeah, that, <laughs> of course it makes sense, but you say uh, they don't have to agree with that, uh, but that also means that art can trigger aggression against itself. It can be destroyed. It, it, it very often is. This is yes. the most complicated thing, no? that, uh, that needs to be hooked up. Does, does that say anything about the role of art? Does it say, uh, say anything it about more, that specific no. artwork? No, I think this is how, how mankind is. I'm very pessimistic in that. I think it says nothing about the art. No, it's just uh, d people destroy what they don't like. But don't, don't you think in some cases it does say something, like uh, there are statues of colonial uh, oppressors that are being torn down, and I think in, in that case uh, it's saying a lot. It, it, it says that the meaning of the work changed. Yeah. It meant one thing at a certain time, and now it means something else. And what I was saying, this public space is a democratic place, and people can choose to, uh, to have different ideas about it at different times and, and show what they feel with the work of art. Of course. I mean, I mean, the the. I think that, of course, I agree. But the statues of the op oppressors, right? Everything historic. That is. Let's not call that art, art in that sense, right? I think this is not. The, I, that I, wouldn't I, be. I, I disagree that, with you. That's that's made as pieces of art as well. Art can be be, be serving to a, a dictator, and he thinks it's art. And that art has a different kind of purpose to society than some other things that I, we do. I, I, would, uh, I would call that propaganda more than art, right? <laughs> Just they, they don't see it as propaganda. I know they don't, but I do. <laughs> so, and what do we do then with memorials? I mean, you can see them as a kind of propaganda in a, in a positive way or negative way as well. 
comment on them. I don't know. But I agree, actually, with Johannes, that, there's, that there should be like a big distinction between those different kind of art, because I just heard on the radio today that in Poland that they're investing millions in public art. And then I thought, oh, that's good. And then they continue a little bit, and then you find out that the, that is actually to um, support the nationalism, the Polish identity, and to create more nationalism. And in that sense, then you wonder, yeah, what kind of art is it? Is it sort of art made by the uh, people who give the assignment? And so that, that you are, as an artist, not really have an autonomous position, but that you're just executing somebody else's agenda. Or what I prefer is that you, as an artist, sort of introduce something uh, from a more autonomous position. And, uh, which hopefully creates some ambiguity in, within a space. Well, but you could see both as expressions of art. Most of the time, the sculptures are made by artists, people who call themselves artists. No, I'm also fine to call it art. That's why I would like to... Uh, to I think that the term art is just too general, uh, in a way. <coughs> now we are now talking about it, because we were talking also about uh, the stained windows in churches, and that's, when they did that, there was also a completely different the idea of the artist that we have now and also here in the West, that's sort of not something that existed like 200 years ago or that was more the, um, how do you say that, ambachtsman? The, yeah, more the craftsman. Uh, and I think sort of the, actually the autonomous position and to, uh, that it becomes more about thinking also and about ideas instead of communicating somebody else's ideas, or maybe they are connected to those ideas, but that there is sort of a transformation happening within, um, within that happened within the art. And I really personally am a big favor of sort of the, the moments that people are getting confronted with somebody, that, something that they're not really uh, know they want it, or maybe they don't even want it, but it's what you, what happens with public art very often that they put some, play something, everybody's very pissed off, and then, okay, after three years they want to take it down, and then everybody's pissed off again because they are taking it away. Yes, keep your hands off my bloody piece of art. Exactly. <laughs> so there's a sort of, it's, it's sort of, it's not like a, uh, a fixed thing. There's always transformation happening, and I think that sort of is what an art work should also... So art, art needs time to get used to. Could be. Acceptance. Yeah, maybe. That is, yeah, the, uh, sometimes, not always. Some art works are immediately loved. I mean, there's like a lot of different art. Yeah, I just thought, like, we, I feel like we talk a bit about these pieces of art that are in public space, but of course, there are so many ways of uh, art being present in public space, and it's not only like a sculpture on a pedestal in the street, or like this thing on the, how you call this, a rotonde. Um, so there's, yeah, I think, yes, maybe also in these last uh, decades, there are much more way of intervening in public space, and uh, like performance art also, and um, yeah. So maybe um, it's good to mention that as well, that it's not only this thing that people are, that you can walk around or that people are confronted with. And, and let's, um, because we have these things, oh, it starts with me. Why do you start with me, Javier? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can't read what is on that, but that's, my name, oh, that's, that was my statement. In the public environment, there's no demand for art. Uh, we mentioned that already. Uh, but a great need uh, that people have. Um, we discussed it already. I think there, there is a need in society for art. I, I fully agree with, with, with all of you. Um, but I think there's also the, 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 the problem of acceptation. And, and we, we come to that later on. This is something that... Uh, I did uh, in a an, uh, an hospital. Actually, it was an, uh, a remake of an, uh, one of my first commissions that I had once uh, in, uh, in art. 
And um, that was completely different. I was very strict when I was very, very young. And um, this is from a few years ago. I'm older and wiser. And I say, oh, oh, oh I just keep making landscapes. That's it. Can you describe different. maybe what we look at? I, I, it's hard for me to uh, see what it is. Uh, actually, I call it always a landscape. It's about horizon. That's the blue line. Uh, it's also about geometries, constructions, because that's something that I always have uh, in, my, in my work. And a part of it is painted in contradiction to the organization of uh, neon tubes, for example. Maurice. Hi. Can you tell something about uh, this picture that you sent in? Yeah, I, uh, yes, I can. I choose this picture for two reasons. Because um, my art practice is based on uh, environments I encounter. And there, what I find, I to try to use that as a sort of, yeah, to make something or to reflect on where I am at. And this is at the place in Rotterdam on the island from Brienenoord at Buitenplaats Brienenoord. And I did there a project um, uh, to solve something an architect actually couldn't solve. Uh, so they asked me to make an artwork with it. Um, and then we decided to collaborate together with that institute that was there. And we started thinking together, what are we going to do? And we came up with to start a residency program uh, where artists came to work for three months uh, to do a research project uh, based on water. Um, I programmed myself as the first artist. And this, for me, my uh, assignment, I commissioned myself to sort of start the thing. And I did two things with it. The thing that you see, the little wa water, is like a miniature polder, because the knotted willow behind there was already there. Um, because I come from a polder, so it's just like sort of as a starting point for the project, I thought it would be good to introduce myself. And then I did a performance where I did a, a, perform a medley with um, yeah, a whole bunch of kind of like the big names in performances, uh, and this is uh, from Bruce Nauman, self-portrait as a fountain, where I uh, yeah, sort of did an interpretation of those as a starting point. But then after that, I sort of gave on the project, and yeah, then it went sort of went. Uh, other artists went, well, not literally, but to Brazil, and we were sort of like to get like the colonial perspective on water, and so in that sense, we kind of cover the world. But this was my starting point here, <laughs> sort of from the polder and uh, from the, the, those big names from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You, you, you mentioned something that, that triggered me to the next question. Um, you're saying, we solved something that the architects couldn't solve. Yes. Should artists solve the problems that architects cannot solve? Not necessarily, but it was also a critique towards the architect because it was uh, um, SuperU Studios, uh, which is a great architecture firm that do a lot of uh, cir circularity, um, but they couldn't find a solution for the, the rubble, the, mm -hmm. the bricks and the pieces of concrete. And then I was a little bit no, I mean, they did an amazing job, eh? so, there, so the critique is in it that I thought, okay, in a way you're cherry picking and you should also find like a solution to the, to the concrete and the rubble that's there instead of yeah, cherry pick too much. So then I made a wall out of it uh, around the, which you can't see, but uh, the little uh, water that's like a continuation of the wall. Uh -huh. And I actually also did this because uh, when you look at it, it doesn't look like art, which I think is also, uh, in this case, a good thing. <laughs> I think that's, that's inherent in the way that you perform your art. Uh, sometimes, that is, uh, yeah. But in this case, it was, there was already too much of me in there, uh, sort of too much of the, and so that there should be a space for other people. So I try to sort of retract myself a little bit. Yeah. Marieke. Hi, yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> yeah, hi. 
Um, yeah, this was in fact my sentence, and I had also another picture. Uh, I can start off with this one. It's um, my practice is around urban uh, choreography. I have a background in dance and fine arts and performance art. And um, in fact, what my main topic is is to um, lay bare a kind of um, poetic layer in the daily um, gestures of the people in the street or the bypassers. And um, errare, I really like this word. It's uh, Italian Latin for uh, roam around. And it's also connected, of course, to error. And I think, um, yeah, on one hand, the, the roaming around without any purpose in public space, like the, uh, of course, uh, the Boer, the, the psychogeographers uh, uh, were also doing this drifting around and um, having like this non-economic um, way of going through the public space without any goal. And I think it's, uh, for me, what I do is I, I, I take people on a lead, I do walks with people in their own house, in their, around their own blocks where I take them, uh, I give them like another gaze on uh, the spaces they pass by in their daily uh, yeah, passing or in their daily way. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you can show the other picture as well. It's uh, this one. It's what I also do is like, uh, yeah, like quite unspectacular performative encounters with um, uh, fellow inhabitants. In, in this case, in my town of Amsterdam, I was meeting someone um, or I invited people to sit with me at the table and then I asked them to do a walk on paper and starting at their bedside and uh, showing their route uh, till the moment they left their house. And then I was really precisely like interviewing them. Okay, so you go out of your bed and okay, do you turn? And, and they say, yeah, I go to the toilet. They say, okay, but do you get dressed or not? Or So there was this whole in fact, conversation, and I think the conversation was maybe the most important or most interesting part. Uh, that, yeah, so that showed like this, yeah, all these uh, daily itineraries that are in fact designed by architects. And um, I, uh, yeah, so that is part of my uh, practice, which in fact I can tell maybe now or, or, or later also that I did this art week here with students and my first um, assignment to them was to um, to think about the this building of uh, Baukunde and to um, to roam around and to to go over all the surfaces that are once designed to uh, yeah to to walk around so they went from attic to basement and they came back and they discovered the shower somewhere or they so they uh, yeah they went through the whole building and i think uh, it was for them the of course their first years but the first time that they really had to go through the whole building through all the spaces all the staircases and uh, i thought it was quite interesting so that 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 means art is creating awareness your your work yeah maybe That's another gaze or like mm -hmm. maybe some poetry in the uh, in something daily that might seem, yeah, unnoticed, yeah. Well, that's, that's probably a form of awareness. Johannes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you sent this one. Yeah, it's, it's actually, unfortunately, it's not mine, but uh, a good friend of mine, Tanya Teodoro, once made a very beautiful small artwork. It was made from a piece of paper and a shashlik uh, uh, wooden piece. It was a little flag, a little white flag, let's say six by seven centimeters. And on this little white flag, very tiny, right? There was this sentence written, art makes my life better than art. And then I thought, wow, uh, God, I, I don't grasp it. And at, at the same time, it seems an open door, right? That of course, right? And... Uh, um, I chose it maybe as a reaction to your saying that architecture is the mother of all arts, right? 
That's what the, the, the architects are always saying. <laughs> no, and then I thought, uh, maybe what I like about the sentence, and I think the sentence really evokes something very different with all of you, uh, and it evokes different things with me every time I read it, right? So what I like about it, that there's, uh, uh, it talks about uh, uh, the necessity that, that art is not alone, right? It's not an isolated thing. It needs a, a, a life, it needs a context, it needs us. The humans, without that, there is no art. Uh, and I like that it that it is uh, uh, it is relative here. It makes art smaller than it sometimes seems to be, right? So it, it's it's sort of an anti-hierarchical sentence, and that is what I like about the whole thing. And that is what I like about art that it can be anti-hierarchical. So in that sense, of course, look all the all the city all the city uh, statues tear them down, right? So should we should we uh, should we ask ourselves the question: How would the city look like if it first was built by art, and then the architects come up and fill it in with the buildings? Yeah. What would be the difference then? <laughs> what would be the difference? Did, could we look at the image quickly because it, the the image the, next to it gives sort of a funny answer to it. The image from, the the image from uh, oh. here you go. Now I have to shortly explain it. Sorry that it's not one but six, and what you see is something. Uh, it's the interiors of a uh, Jörglandje. Jörglandje is uh, 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 a playground where kids can uh, fabricate their own little huts and houses. And uh, the good news is this: this is the complicated answer to Peter's question. They can do anything that they like, right? But what they do is they collect things from the trash and then bring them to this. Uh, place and then let's say build interiors that are that they yeah. have and then the question comes borrowed because of the things that they use from the grown-up world right or are, are these the interiors that the kids would like to have mm -hmm. and then there's two things that you please just two things that you please kindly look at number one look how incredibly clean the uh, the interiors are and it didn't change anything at all right there's, there's no mess, and the kids are 13, 14, 15. Uh, that is number one. And the number two is that there is uh, um, everything, there's sort of a hierarchy in it, and that listens to the banal principle of electricity. Anything that can be driven by electricity is worth something because it begins a potential use in the space because they have electricity. That's all they have. Right? So they, they, they can theoretically run the broken old coffee uh, coffee machine from the trash and make tea, right? Because there's, that's the only thing they can do there. So this is what kids do, uh, what, can, what kids can do if they build their own houses with the leftovers from the grown-up world. And then think that, right? This is what the kids would do. Then how, how incredibly re, reusing other things would the artist uh, be going ahead. I believe this is what artists are good at, you know, reusing things. Yeah, that's 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 the, the, the I think probably the old principle that we have. Eh? We, we as children we're much more open uh, in, in, in our creative processes because we're not influenced already and, and we make completely different things. We're really more open. I think that's probably one of the main things that we uh, that art contributes. It makes it gives us another way of thinking. And probably that's a very important part in the discussion in public space. That, and and if we make the step to education, um, the creative process. What's the difference? Not in in the making of of the the work of art itself, but in the way the things develop between architecture and 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 art. Oh. And what, what, what can the, art, the, the architects learn from the artist? I think the not knowing. I think um, that's what I experience also here with the students who we work with and uh, that they really want to know what they have to do and they want to gain knowledge. And uh, especially, I think, in this design module they had to do. And then, well, I started uh, being really vague on purpose with them. And they said, yeah, it's so vague. I said, yeah, that's good. So try to stay a bit in this vagueness and not knowing and just sit and, and wait for something to happen. And I think that was the hardest for them. 
But in the end, I s they were they were amazing what they what they produced. Uh, they started making drawings, and uh, I think there's a lot what we lose in our um, learning career as uh, children that we that, that there has to be a purpose to anything to everything that we have to learn that we have to gain this knowledge and that we can't play around or fuck around any excuse me uh, play around anymore and 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 fail and not know and just uh, let be i think those are really important uh, matters but now you're you're talking from a uh, maker's perspective yes but but he asked me the 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 for architects and Artist, what uh, about the process you're, you're asking? Or yeah, not? One, one can talk about the process, how things develop, but what, what can we, what, what can architects really learn about the creative process that we follow in our thinking as artists and that architects do differently? I mean, they always confronted with, with the whole program that they have to realize, they have to translate everything into what I always call hardcore architecture because uh, the, the task is to make buildings. Uh, in the end, or to, to make a uh, city plan. So, how does that maybe, maybe there's less compromises in art, as it seems, but I'm not, not really sure about that, right? Mm -hmm. And there's maybe more, there has to be more compromises in a building, or in building something. I like that, I like the compromises. Not all of them, but I think there's, there's something good about it. I think this is what most people probably dislike about art, that they're thinking, you know, that they don't see me. Has that to do with, uh, I mean, we, we, we started with the T of technology. This is very, very heavy, as we pronounced. Um, we're talking about the poetry of uh, the way of thinking that, that we have in it. How do, they, how do the, the, they translate that? How did they do that in the, that, that, that bachelor course that you did with them? How did you see translating them? I thought the students were fantastic, and, and what we just discussed maybe relates a bit to my sentence. Uh, I don't know if it's somewhere in the slides, but can we look for it? Yeah, yes. this one. I hope it all appeals to you students. Uh, don't work. Never work. Play. Because I think it's, uh, again, like Johanna said, it's also sadly not by me. It's uh, it, You could say it's by Johan Huizinga, who was a... Um, a thinker of early 20th century, and he was very uh, big about the homo ludens, eh? so the playing uh, person. And I mean it very seriously, so I don't mean to say that you should, uh, well, I mean, if you want to fool around, also do fool around, but I think a game is very serious. Uh, and I think uh, uh, that's what art can bring. It can show this, this game element that we all know, on the one hand, as, as a child, and that my students found in themselves. Eh? I, I, some students in the art week came to me and said, I'm sorry, madam, but what's a concept? And they had this really this fear in their eyes. And I think at the end of the week, you know, one boy came and said, yeah, I took out all the trash and I made this model. And another girl said, I just love animals. So I, I drew a map with all the animals that, you know, and they found some kind of playfulness. Yeah. But I think there's something else. This is the part about the maker. I think art in public space operates within a in a space that also has rules and that's why i like this quote so much and hey you asked us to also spice up uh, maybe the discussion and not agree on everything and i'm wondering if not in all art in public space there is to some extent propaganda not in the sense that it's there because the artist put it there and it could be but it's also always a public uh, a political decision which work gets put where and so different times eh, show different things. So uh, windows in churches were supposed to uh, make us understand religion or make us religious. And, uh, and I think even now this could be an inter interesting discussion. Why is it there? Um, how, how does it get there? Who decides it? So th that what you mean it's always serving in one or some way because the, 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 the commissioner always gives a meaning already by determining where the art should be, what kind of art it should be, choosing the artist. Exactly, and I have two examples in my images, I guess. Well, to take this one, uh, it's a dumb square. It's a, a, a space uh, we use to commemorate uh, 
the Second World War, but also other uh, genocides and uh, well, important and horrible moments in history. And in Corona time, uh, there was an open call by the Stedelijk Museum and Foreign Five May Committee uh, to commemorate 75 years of freedom. And they asked artists and, and writers to reflect on uh, the notion of openness. And at that time, uh, Thierry Baudet was saying, Corona proves again we should shut, uh, close all the borders. And I thought that's, that's such nonsense on so many levels that uh, my proposal was to uh, paint uh, flags, uh, hand paint with all the colors of all the flags of the world, but open colors between the borders. So uh, the col colors overflow. Uh, and I found it interesting that apparently all the countries of the world share 12 colors, more or less. So it's, there's not, not even much more. And then I asked uh, some women, uh, friends, and uh, uh, to perform the flag. So to hold it in a local place that they found important uh, in this notion of openness. So here's Alex, uh, who put it on Dam Square. And at some point she asked me, is it okay if I take off my pants? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, sure, if that's, you know, what you want to do, you, it's your, I ask you to perform. And then I put this on Instagram and I thought in a way the, w the real work happened on Instagram because a lot of uh, hate erupted. There was a lot of people saying, how does this, uh, forgive my language, but quote, how does this ass showing relate uh, to the Holocaust? What would your grandmother say? That was directed to me. Huh? What, and Well, then I could reply, my grandmother was quite liberal, so I think she would probably, you know, like it. Uh, but I thought this discussion was great. And, and then a lot of people said, well, maybe it's also about freedom to be who you want to be or freedom of women to wear what they want to wear. Why would it not, you know, why could this not be an image of the openness? And I think for me, that's what art in public space can be. It, of, so often it's treated as a, a problem. Yeah, like you say, we're confronted with it. Or as a solution, it needs to solve an ugly spot or it needs to solve a discussion. But I think it's neither of those. I think all it can do is is be, you know, uh, it can it can make the, it can create life in a discussion in, in the best in the best sense. The art creates the polemic, and that's that's what it's for. That's and it doesn't have one meaning. The meaning can change with the discussion we have. But then it means it can all be also be censured by the commissioner. I think if you would propose this uh, in a contest for, for example, the Holocaust monument, then the same would happen with all what quite often happens with the question of monuments, that in the end, the commission is not given to an artist, but to an architect. Pro probably, but maybe Because he makes yeah. a thing that's very acceptable, very brave, doesn't mean anything that much, at least it's, ex it's accepted. Do you think this would be accepted as a monument by by community from Amsterdam or whatever? I think it is a monument, but of a very different kind than gets accepted by committees. Yeah, it's already there. It has been there, and it's now like uh, disseminated in this way. So you can't take it away anymore. It, but it it is it it lives its life in not in the, the, the real world, in the digital world. Well, I, I wonder, is the digital world not real? Yeah. That's, that's I, I, I'm not sure those kids over there uh, would agree, I think. <laughs> you know? Is it not a part of our daily life that we get confronted with a public space? It's a people... different kind of public space, that's it's true. It's a very different kind of public space, yeah. indeed. Yes. And maybe the, the next, I have one more image, yeah. uh, bear with me. It's probably unreadable, but it's... Completely. Was, yeah, completely. <laughs> I'll just read it from memory. It was my first artwork ever, and it's a, a, a letter to my neighbors asking them to pay that amount of my rent they were taking up in my space with their noise, um, which was quite a lot. And, uh, uh, you know, here again, this, this letter was just something done out of spite because I, I had, to do, had to graduate. I had these horrible neighbors. I didn't know what to do. But then I sent it as an invitation to my graduation show and I asked a lot of people, did you get my invite? And a lot of people said no, but you never believe what this horrible neighbor sent me now. And that taught me that, you know, of course an art can be a monument, can be a sculpture, but it, it can also happen in the mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think in that sense, you, you are right, like we, we need to talk about... Yeah, there's different kinds of art and, and well, this is, this is for me where the interesting part happens. 
and this is also public space, I think. It's not just a sculpture. I think that's, that's a, a somewhat archaic notion of what, what art is. Yeah, but the, you can disagree, yeah? This is just to open up the discussion. No, but I agree, <laughs> totally. <laughs> But the digital world is a selective public space. Not all the people are in all the Instagrams and whatever there is. Doesn't that go also for is our, our public in, space? In yeah. There's so many people who can't enter Holland. So I think uh, the public space of Holland is also somewhat selective. Well, the public space in Holland is at least uh, available for 30 million people. And they are confronted whether they ask it or not. If I go to Instagram, I choose to go to Instagram. If I'm walking on the street, I never ask to be confronted with something. Well, but there is a difference in, public, yeah? in the quality of that public space and in the openness of that public space. Yeah, I, I find it interesting, your, your choice of words in the sense of confronted, eh? because to me that makes art almost sound like a... Well, confronted a is not, not especially center, negative. Yeah. No? No, not especially negative. It can be both ways. You mean encountered as in confronted? Yeah. But about this space or public space or, or I think everyone choose, choose to, to go somewhere. So whether it's outside or I think this is also kind of public space or whether it's on the digital um, highway. I think it's as valid uh, public space. Uh, sorry to agree with you, uh, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> as, uh, yeah, the, the analog space, as to say. But, but something else then, there must be some architects here, no, in the audience, please raise your hands, yes. Uh, I think no <laughs> No one. architect presence, oh, <laughs> they run away. <laughs> yeah, one. No, I think, I think the, what, what I'm always I'm being forced to or not to, if you build something and the building comes, I think what we're talking about now is the, the sort of brotherhood, sisterhood of, of the building and the art piece, no, in a way. Right, and uh, um, that, 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 that they don't appear to be one, obviously, right? People try to separate them, see them as an add-on to the building, strangely enough, no? Although one could say the other way around, if it's well incorporated, it's just one piece, right? There's no distinction, and then I think the whole idea of the confrontation is different. If you, it, the example with the church windows that you gave, I, I wouldn't feel confronted by the windows, I would be confronted by the whole church, maybe, right? But not specifically by the by the by the elements of art. So in that sense, we're also confronted with with architecture. But yeah, we, that's what I'm trying to say, yeah, right? Yeah, it's yeah. one; it's not two things. No. But again, uh, let's go back to the influence of of uh, the way of thinking, probably of of uh, in, in the creative process in education. Because that where we, where we were more or less, and I'm I'm curious. Uh, you already mentioned what you experienced uh, in, in in the Kunstwerk. What I, what I see, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm teaching here uh, uh, architecture as well, and I'm one of the few who starts some courses with the the act of poetry. So we first want to enter it from the poetic side, and then we will translate it in one or some way. But what you see is that students find that very, very, very difficult to make that step, the first step to get rid of the concept. They're raised within the architectural education by thinking in concepts. And you ask them, uh, they, now they ask you what the concept is. I always tell them here, you have 10 concepts. But I didn't check them. I don't know whether they are good ideas. They're just an idea. But we have to check it. And I think probably in, in, in that process, artists think in a different way. They approach that in a different way than architects do. They go into solutions. We go into a kind of mindset, probably. Or do you see that differently? Not at all. I think artists never believe in an end result. No, I know very little artists that believe it's finished now. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I was there. Yeah, I think there are many answers to this. Um, I sometimes can tell a student if you really already made up totally what you're going to make, why make it? Because I think 
it's good to start. Of course, it's good to have a concept or a starting point, and then it's uh, the thinking is in the making. I think that's important, maybe. So you could say a, a, a box of feathers is probably the concept of a bird, but it's not a bird yet. You have to do something with it. It's are your words. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's 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 in the making, but I think that's uh, that's that's completely true. Of course, the process of making is very important. But again, how can art help them to translate the poetic parts into that making, into that architect? What's the different approach that we have, and architects do it in a different way? I don't really believe in the we at the moment because when I work, I do actually work very much in solutions, but they're all temporary solutions. But then a new solution that creates also new problems, and then sort of, so there's like an ongoing game. But I very much do work in solutions, and I don't think that poetry is for me a starting point. Or, well, I also don't read poetry because somehow I'm, I'm unable to. So, I don't know. It's, it's, I feel like a, there's like a distinction made between artists and architects. Also, that's not necessarily there, because I know also architects that are working quite free or also not. Um, but what I did like actually that we all had uh, very different approaches to the to the teaching moment, and but in the way they were all kind of like delaying the students to make a decision, I thought. So it was all kind of like making detours. Yeah. I felt a little bit like that, at least for me it was. And then in the end, somehow because making a lot of detours, in the end you do get to your end point, but how you get there in that way, then you allow, I don't know, yeah, maybe that's when the poetry comes in, in the detour or something. I don't know if that's 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 more or less the process of uh, the creative process to, to 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 develop something, check it, develop it again and again and again. And yeah, but that was our task here at the yeah. at the art week, also I think, because that uh, yeah there was a tendency to to jump to conclusions. So that that is then the main influence of art on the creative process in architects. Yeah. Maybe, because then you when you start thinking in detours and the, the, there's the, doesn't the, should art give the, the, shouldn't art give a different kind of end result then in that sense. Why do you think uh, so logical? I, I think I think um, what I just said, uh, art is often seen as a solution and a problem. Those are two logical constructs uh, it, it's of cause and effect. I think art does not operate in that kind of logics. And I think that's what it can bring the education that it's it's not only the the functionality or the or the or the aesthetics or the theory there is something else and I think it's it's not not that difficult it's something we all know yeah, like Johannes when you show the kids uh, making their interiors it's not really about logic I guess they just put what they like and I, uh, and to me that relates strongly to playfulness and that's that's what I saw when in the end you know there was one boy who uh, who had to um, show the, the difference between openness and closeness. And he was like, yeah, but what do I need to do? I don't know, how do I show it? And then I got a bit desperate and I said, okay, what's your hobby? And then he said, golf. And I got even more desperate because I don't <laughs> feel anything, you know, when you say golf, so I was like, help. But then I just thought, okay, you have this little golf ball and it goes through the air, flies through the air all in the openness. And then it ends up you know, in a hole somewhere, in a, in a closeness. And this was something he could understand. So I think it's it's all there, but I think we really need to stop to treat it so rationally. No, it doesn't bring us other solutions. No, it's it's not about solutions. Uh, and I think in a way, But you know, architects have to make solutions. They, they have a proper question. They have to come to a solution. Well, I think that's that's a very specific uh, perception of what architecture is. That is very predominant still here in Delft, and it's called functionalism. Perhaps. Architecture is just four walls. That's what I learned uh, a few yeah, weeks ago. Yeah, four walls and a roof. That's it. That's the concept. Oh. Not not even the roof. <laughs> just four walls. That's basic, very basic architecture. 
closed, uh, enclosed space. Yeah, around some empty air. <laughs> <laughs> we asked for some protection, we asked for some climate control, so th there is a functionality. But, but look, uh, the, the responsibility of an architect is, let's, let's say, can be more dramatic or more profound than of an artist, maybe? Practically, in real life, if it goes wrong with the building, you know, if there's the housing is not, there's, I think there's a different kind of responsibility, at least in my uh, wild fantasy, from the architect uh, than from the artist. And it would be great if the artist could take the same, but I don't think in hierarchies, but now in this case, I think, could I? I don't know. Compliment to the architects, by the way. Right? <laughs> well, and, and you say it should be functional, but I was recently in a very beautiful building by Jean Nouvel uh, for the EPO, the European Patent Office. And a lot of the very beautiful details that the people there don't like. So if you speak about confrontational, there's a beautiful water, like a lake flowing over glass panes, but underneath is their server uh, room with all the computers, so they're dead afraid every time that you know some water will leak. So I, I don't know. Uh, is architecture really that that functional? It's uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, probably that's a mistake in the architecture. I don't know. <laughs> or or there's the clash between the imagination of the architect and and then the people who actually work in the building, that, and that, that can be interesting. I was taught that good architecture always leaks. And when I studied here, I was taught that, you know, you can recognize a good reed felt because there's always something leaking. Because he was all about openness, you know, and, and, and panes of glass that could shift and he could never get to detail it perfectly. So maybe good architecture does need to leak. I don't know. I, I, I think the, the, the user will think something <laughs> <I> else about <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's an interesting discussion we can yeah. have. But... Uh, I think you may sell architecture short if you think it of it as merely functional. And I heard you mention poetry, so I think you you do feel something else as well. Yeah, the, uh, we approach it from a different kind of uh, point of view, not not on first hand functionally. But, but for instance, here, why why do we sit in an orange space? I mean, I have to think of of. You know, the family of Orange, our, our royal family, but I'm sure that was never the intention, I guess, right? I mean, what, why? I, I, I never understood that statement. Actually, I hate this, this color because it's a very bad color of orange. The Wh worst why? orange one can imagine. Okay. What, what yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, in, it's uh, architecture is not that functional. No, it's, this is very dysfunctional, I think. <laughs> As this, as we call this space. Now, yeah, but, at the uh, moment, it's may, oh. no. But I think maybe it's interesting because if you uh, create a space like this that is maybe not functional or functional as a way to that there are several things uh, that are possible here, that it also uh, sh uh, creates some space for another way of using it. So it's another kind of functionality, maybe. So in that sense, I think an architect can shape a lot of uh, different spaces, also space for imagination also. And maybe the orange is a bit, uh, well, too much in our face, but still it, um, it can give you a kind of emotion to be here. You know, I can imagine if it would be all gray, that it would be, it would have a different feel about it. So there is also, if you talk about functionality, also about a lot of emotion in architecture, I think. And where do we find then the emotion in architect? Do we find that in, in the way the structure is built up? I mean, we can, we can bring this back to elements in architecture because we see them. So how, how would, do we introduce then that emotion that I, I call it poetry in architecture, whatever the name may be. Maybe you have a better name for me. But where do we find that then? And how do we achieve that? And how can art help architects to achieve that? Well, I think um, just look, you know, if I look at that Christmas tree, I think it looks so odd uh, right here. Yeah, right? They, they just a, buy it. I know, I know, <laughs> they buy it. But that's, a Christmas tree is typically something that is there and it, yet it isn't. It's very generic, eh? this one probably you can, I mean, or 
it looks like every other, but here it gets a special meaning. And I think that's, uh, that was interesting in the Kunstweek, that, that, you know, I just look again at what you do. So if you uh, sketch something, look, look again and look, look with different eyes. And for instance, here, if I look again, I think maybe this orange now, it's uh, a nod to Rem Kohas, eh, who famously made uh, fences out of this building plastic material which is a reference to bu uh, the building process. So I, I don't think this was done you know, without a purpose. I think this has a reason. And perhaps it does evoke an emotion. Perhaps this evokes the building process, which would be very fitting in a, in a school of art. And so just look and look again. And I think that's what, well, what artists do all day, and maybe architects, I know they're very busy solving things, but take your time and look and look again. Does somebody know why this space is orange? Nobody oh, yeah, knows you should have the answer for us. <laughs> Can someone Google it? <laughs> Maybe the orange paint was just really cheap. That could also yeah, probably that was. <laughs> <laughs> but I, don't, I never understood it, actually. And I don't know why they made it orange. But nobody did. Well, I, I know there is this, I don't know if it's a revival. I live in the eastern Docklands in uh, Amsterdam, and it's, uh, I lived there already like for 33 years, and it was once like the end of the world and uh, with city nomads, and now it's really like this yeah, upstate, gentrified uh, neighborhood. And there are a lot of buildings with like these really uh, brightly colored entrance halls. So I think it's really, I don't know if it's a trend, so I, I don't know how long this space is already orange, from how many years? Oh, from, from the start. Yeah, but how long ago is that? That's uh, approximately 10, 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah, so maybe it's a trend. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, that's not, not that long ago. It, it, it was meant temporary. It was to meant to be there only for five years. And then? then we were supposed to have a new building because the old building burned down. That's why we're here. So um, now you're still here. And now we're still here. We're freezing in this hall. So one could say the functionality of architecture <laughs> has failed completely in that sense. In the summer, uh, the, you know, the other uh, hall, then we're dying from heat. The architecture failed again. Well, except for it does function somewhat as a public space. We're all here with our coats. Um, I don't know if that was intentional, but I, I like that idea that there's a kind of public space within this uh, academy. And to me, what was e more weird than, than this orange you know, ocean here is actually the, the halls upstairs. They look totally like offices. I thought, how are you supposed to play you know, in an office? Do these kids are 17 and they go to art school and right away you enter this office space. That, that amazed me much more, actually. Yeah. You mean the studio, say, on the attic? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was also why, amazed. You know? Yeah, yeah. So that means that we should also alter probably some conditions within this building to yeah. trigger the students to be more playful, yeah. more open. Create more space. Like, there are a lot of tables. Everyone is, like, forced to sit at the table. And I think you also have to, uh, to get rid of the A3. Of, of the one? <laughs> Never. The A3 is gold. <laughs> A3 is dead. <laughs> it's not dead, it's alive. <laughs> Are the students themselves here allowed to change the rooms they, they get educated in? No, that's also very difficult because these, because of these tables are connected to each other, so you cannot easily <laughs> change them. But could, could they paint the wall or could they...? I think the dean will get very, very angry in that case. Other questions or remarks from somebody from the public, by the way? Yes. Yeah, I didn't choose this uh, color sweater on purpose, uh, to be honest. <laughs> but um, you referred several times during the discussion to Instagram as being a public space. But as far as I'm concerned, it's a very private space because you really have to play by the rules that are set uh, not by a dem democratic process, but really by Mark Zuckerberg and Meta and his commercial interests. How do you reflect on that? No, I think you're totally right. Uh, I, I think you could see internet as a public space and Instagram like a, a separate corner or square within it. 
But I think also in public space there is rules, and that's why, why I try to reference play. Yeah? I think you should play, but also realize the public space is a play. So much as art gets chosen politically, Instagram is very well dominated by those rules, and they depend on who owns it. For instance, Twitter eh, is, is now changing, because it's changed yeah, ownership. If, if you can buy a public space, then it was not a public space. Yeah. Well, a country owns, in a way, public space. So um, I guess maybe maybe the nature of public space is that it does have rules. Yeah, but um, it's not said that there's no rules in the public space. But in the public space, the rules are set by all of us in a democratic open process and not by one or two people. What, but also a company. Yeah, not by one entity that uh, dictates the rules and can change them any time they like. I, I would hope so. It doesn't work like that in all countries, uh, sadly. But no, for instance, in Holland, something I discovered is uh, in the metro, you have these big um, uh, commercial screens uh, that look like a very big iPad. And you have a black uh, uh, yeah, line around them. And I didn't know, but there's a little camera there. And the camera looks back at you looking. No, not anymore. They're removed. There's I know, because a friend, of my, a friend of mine uh, who works for Bits of Freedom, they... Uh, 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 how do you say, they, uh, they went to the court and said this shouldn't be allowed. And so the cameras are still there, the technology is there, but the companies are not allowed to use the technology. Yeah, and the lenses themselves are covered. Sometimes, not, not always. Okay, here in Delft they're covered. Uh, yeah, I and I thought that was to me, in, in, in some way, an awakening of how, public, how even the public space in my metro station of Amsterdam that I thought to be democratic, is also has rules and is not you know that that open because if yeah. that technology would advance it would you know allow me to see something on that screen that I had just googled in my home so it you know it would you know it, it would do something very specific yeah, to the public space already possible I know totally yeah but thank God not allowed now thanks yeah. to a bit of bits of freedom but so to answer your question you're absolutely right you could say Instagram is a very specific corner of the public space as I see it. Uh, and it has rules, but I think that all public space does have rules. And it's good to be aware of it. Yeah, but what you're pointing out is that the rules in, in, in uh, let's say, the public space, as we know it in the country or in the city, these rules are determined by a demo uh, democratic process. And on, on, on uh, a thing like Instagram, the rules are set by a company. And that's not chosen democratically. We choose to go on Instagram or not. That's not a thing. Yeah, but I think the behavior of the people who use it, and I think that counts also for public space, is uh, also uh, shifting the rules or the way people deal with the rules also. I think that counts also for Instagram, the, w the way it is... Um, uh, it became so big, it was because the way it was used by, by the, um, the users. And I think that counts also for public space. I think if you want to have a uh, public space on the internet, it should stick to open standards and open protocols so that you can always run your own service and your own uh, things like with uh, ActivityPub or your own website with RSS feed on it. Then you can speak of a, of a real public space. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. I think those are, are great comments. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, and one more thing about the orange of the room. It's this room also has an official room number, so I was struggling where to find it until someone said, ah, oh, it's the orange place. So that was very easy. Uh, it's, it's very recognizable, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else? Uh, Max. Hi, yeah. my name is Max. Uh, 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 Julia, a... come down, come down. Uh, someone else wanted? Yeah, as well. You go first. Uh, I'm a student in the school, uh, and I wanted to agree with the fact that you mentioned about our second floor, because we call it the atelier. But if you look uh, at it in an, uh, like in an objective way, it's not really an atelier. It's just like an office space. And I think uh, it's not really a question, but more something we have to make a point, a point out of it, I think, that uh, there should change something or uh, that the students should come up with something or that the discussion should be started because now we're getting trained to sit behind uh, a computer yeah. rather than be playful. So I thank you for bringing this up. <laughs> Julia. Uh, my question is a bit uh, 
<laughs> you're, you're too small. <laughs> Or the mic is too high, yeah? It's not necessarily her, uh, her yeah. fault. Yeah, uh, coming a little bit back to Instagram, by coincidence uh, that we're having this talk tonight. But for two days now, maybe you've encountered this. There have been uh, many, many artists, especially posting, oh yeah, posting um, a, uh, a specific banner against AI-generated imagery because they believe that threatens art and the creation of and, and copyright. So basically now you can type in, I want uh, a new Monet painting, then you have a Monet, but it's new, but it looks exactly like Monet. Uh, what do you think that will change for us in the future? Or do you have any opinions on it? Uh, will AI be regulated? Does it affect the way we create? Yeah, I, I find it super interesting and I have a friend that works um, for Guerrilla Games, a, a, a game studio, and uh, she just sent me, uh, I will look it up later, maybe somebody else can go first, but she sent me an AI-generated review of my work, which, uh, which I found very hilarious. So I'll look it up when maybe somebody else wants to go first. Uh, yeah, I think... Um it's really interesting that I think it's only an, you say, enrichment to the field. Um, I know there are already a lot of artists who work with uh, artificial intelligence also. And um, yeah, I think we have to, of course, I think it's really good to be aware of all the pitfalls that are in this field. But I think it's good to, uh, to embrace it in a way as well and to see um yeah how we can um yeah maybe apply it or uh, how we c yeah to be aware of it also yeah i think it's interesting and there's a lo i'm not i'm totally i'm like the opposite i'm really working analog but i'm still very interested in uh, what's happening there yeah yeah but also it might be bring oh, sorry <laughs> might bring value to your analog work maybe because it becomes more rare in a way yeah, it's funny because I just had this uh, meeting with some students at uh, uh, Rietveld Academy where I work and uh, there is this, uh, we're organizing a workshop on artificial intelligence in January. And um, it's funny because there, there are a lot of students, uh, the younger generation who are really, uh, who can also, um, who are very skilled in, in creating this, uh, uh, yeah, these algorithms or to, to, to work with this artificial intelligence. And there is this kind of counter um, uh, act also that people start working really like with their hands and making handcrafted uh, um, things work with materials so I think one stimulates the other also so it's, it's like this bit of a ping pong uh, effect look uh, I think it's not really a threat as look I'm a photographer from a uh, being trained as what I would always say that 60% of the meaning of an uh, image is the context, right? Uh, so the, the bigger question is, can we control or can we sort of be aware of what the context is and how pure or how real or how trustful that could be? And, and then only 40% is the image. Um, and as you're all talking about your students, I can talk about my students as well, and they started photographing analog again. <laughs> You know, for, for whatever strange reason, because they like the experience, they like the failure, they like the unpredictability, and uh, uh, I can't relate to it because I grew up in the analog age, right? So to say it's unpredictable, master the technique then, I would say, they don't, right? I would say the experience, the experience of what? Of spending hours in the dark making a print? No. Well, that's craftsmanship. You need craftsmanship to realize something. Absolutely, but not, but yeah. But then the question is, you know, there, there's so many aspects of that improvement of the digital in photography, right? I think it's sort of tricking yourself, saying, closing your eyes, putting your head on the sand, think it's not there. And I think this is the only thing that artists shouldn't do, right? Sort of escapism from what the matter is. So recognizing the unexpected and making use of that. And that's more to do with the open mind again. 
Yeah, but I think the way they will uh, experience the analog, uh, maybe it's not comparable to to your uh, way of, of working. No, with of the course analog. not. I'm sorry. Of course not. Absolutely no. not. So it will g give them some other knowledge of the digital as well, or or you don't, or or I don't know. Most likely, but they're they're quite uh, they're quite uh, unoutspoken in it, and I, I, I sympathize with that. There's there's no judgment involved. Just to say that there's, you know, not, not, not everything is sort of act, counteract. Things are unpredictable in that sense, right? They're, they're, mm. Or let them fail. And e yeah. Even in their experience, sometimes things are just shitty. And maybe this is something that, uh, that yeah. That, I mean, it sounds like artists are free and can do anything that they want. But there's a lot of suffering involved and not, um, am I good or am I bad? But many things that one does as an artist are simply not good, right? And only a very few things are okay. Yeah, let's throw, let's throw, be honest. You throw away right? quite a lot of your experiments. You throw away quite a lot of your experiments before you choose. Uh, yeah, the or they one. end up in public space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's um, what you get if you put pretend to be an art critic praising the works of Sarah. So that within a few seconds, the AI wrote, "As I stand before Sarah's Faraday tent, I'm struck by the thought-provoking and introspective nature of the piece." This installation invites the viewer to consider the ways in which technolo technology and digital communication can both connect and disconnect us from the world around us. And I thought, you know, at one hand, wow, you know, may, do we need art critics even if, you know, this already exists? I think that's completely unnecessary. <laughs> Perhaps. But then again, I thought, you know, it's a very generic text. It doesn't say so much. But I, to me, the most beautiful about this text is that it's, a digital entity who is talking about connecting and disconnecting. But the fact that I can see this beauty, that's, that's because I'm not that. Yeah. Yeah, so to, to answer your question, I think it, it is a source of you know, inspiration and fascination, but there is something uh, very decidedly different between you and, and at least until now and the AI. Yeah, but we, will, we use it already, it's used in our lives and we will use it more and more and Instagram uses it and everything uses it, but perhaps, well, to quote you, the poetry is what we need to do. Yeah. Well, probably we can conclude that the poetry is important. Yeah, please, please come down, come down. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say something because I shoot analog and I've quit shooting digital and uh, <laughs> that's specifically for the single reason that every time I travel and I used to carry my digital camera with me. So for example, um, one trip to Rotterdam on a weekend and I have around, I don't know, 800 pictures with me on my digital camera and shooting analog, one, it's way too expensive. Um, yeah, I have to rely on my boyfriend for cooking my dinner. Uh, so, uh, so here's the thing, right? So you end up shooting 800 pictures on a weekend, and then you have to waste your time trying to curate what picture really matters to you. So if you're shooting a medium which is much more expensive, you think, well, not twice, but like 10 times before you actually take the frame because does it really matter to you? And then that one frame has much more worth uh, when you actually you know, spend the buck to develop it and then scan it. So. But, but maybe it has more. It is more worthy or more important to you because you are you work with it. Right. You you print it and you you scan it and you use it. Use image and use is a bad combination, but it's part of what you do, right? And maybe the eight hundred just remain on the in the digital stash and are not used. Maybe that's that's the main complication. Maybe. maybe. But it also it also forces you to look much better. Oh, 100%. To make your composition much better. I've, I, no. I frame frames in my mind and I don't shoot them anymore because I don't think they're worth it. Can I say something very sure. stubborn? Next to you is a book that you all get as a present. Uh, it's made in Athens uh, in two weeks and I photographed and there you go. And I really horror 4,000 images and thought, well, this is too much to give to anyone to make a book out of. So I chose 600 and all the 600 are in the book. And then I, I just... Trust me, I could have never done that uh, analog. Sure, but uh, so you say there are 600 images in there. Yeah. And do you value each of the image the same Very way? much. Then, I mean, it depends on the photographer then. 
I guess you need to be a better critic of yourself no, just, if you believe 600 images are equally valuable. Maybe look at the book first, but... Uh, yeah, sure, uh, for uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> look, now, I'm, I'm, I think when I'm trying to say something else, uh, I think it is interesting to... to uh, I think there's interesting, there's sort of a dynamics of a discrepancy of a sort of a change in perspective on, uh, let's say, uh, the medium, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, photography. It, look, I was the guy that went somewhere, took one photograph and left. On the way to the job, nothing. On the way back, nothing, right? And that, then I thought, as I'm sort of visually dependent on everything, and as I have obviously a thought about everything, why not photograph more? simply, right? Why restrict myself to such an unbearable rule of only one image, right? So I think it's nice that, that you come back to the idea of from the multitude back to the single image, and I from the single image develop into the multitude. It's, it's, it's another way of working, the other way around. You're making Maybe. the same selection, you do it in advance, because you have to, to be careful with your uh, precious film, and you can do it afterward because you have a huge amount of, of images. But you do the same selection process in some way. Probably there is a different way of looking, uh, analyzing. Uh, I think probably that's depending personally. What of one course. get used to probably. I don't know. Oh, 100%. But it's also that our generation is so much more involved with the digital medium every mm -hmm. day, every second. You kind of prefer taking a step back and going back into something where you're kind of realizing that there's more value uh, something that's more manual, I would say. But that's just me, though. Yeah, no, so, maybe it, so maybe it doesn't has to have to do with the medium, but more with the, the gesture of yeah, the taking the step back and, yeah. and looking in a different way at, at, yeah. uh, at your acts. Or, uh, Look, I totally yeah. adore your, 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 your bravery to say, stop, you know, I don't do it anymore. I just take this one image. I really adore that. I think that's very brave to do. Right? Because right. I, I, I think I couldn't, right? Once, having all the images finally, after all these years, I think I would never give up on that. Oh, for sure, yeah, it's a, it's a huge debate. Uh, but I was curious about one thing, because uh, on the contrary, I'm doing my graduation project on AI and architecture. Uh, and I'm design. Uh, well, the brief is to design a museum where you can display AI. But I'm curious, do you need museums anymore? Uh, because if you want the art and the public space to be the space where you display art, why don't we tear down existing museum and just put art in public, uh, including paintings? And then people just visit streets because there's a painting over there and then the street becomes kind of like a language towards the art, you know? Uh, why don't public spaces just become art themselves? Because you need to create work for architects who can make museums and they're kind <laughs> yeah, of like... <laughs> like the new cathedrals and it's like a tourist thing and there's like a exactly. sharing thing so there's like a lot of reasons to have museums also and we also need I to have a market they, as an artist also I think that's they also exist important next to each other both the museum and, and and the public space and they have different responsibilities in one or some way uh, be, uh, just as we have a lot of different forms of art uh, having their existence in public space, in museums, wherever they are, at, at, at the home of people. Uh, part of it is a very personal choice, part of it is a kind of public choice or public need that we, we can find. I think that, that, that the diversity that we see in art is the most valuable thing that we can have. Also in the public space, we need that diversity. I think, by the way, also that a lot of art that's shown in the museums is also very different art and that's and also different artists, that there are some that do both, yeah. but there's like really, somehow seem to be like completely separate things happening. I, and maybe, I don't know how about you, but the first time I uh, understood that all that I have to look at art was because I liked the, the building that it was in. I thought, well, this is such a nice building. Okay, then look at the art, right? So it was unfortunately not the other way around. It's not that I went there for the artworks, but I went there because I liked the, what I was brought there, because my family liked the, the building as such. So it's, yeah, they, let's keep them for a bit. No? <laughs> it's, it's, it's subjective, I would say. <laughs> Depends on the architect. But, uh, yeah, thank you so much.
I would like to go to some famous last words to the audience so that we can round up a little bit. <laughs> then we start on this side. This. <laughs> What's the last thing that you have to, to, to mention to the audience about art and public space or art and education? <laughs> you didn't see that one coming. No, no, definitely not. No, it's... Uh... Yeah, at the moment, I, at this specific moment, I have nothing to say. Maybe in a few minutes, but for now, it's, uh, okay, now that, I'm that, done. That, I, I hope you, you enjoyed it. Sarah. <laughs> well, I will just repeat myself and say, don't work, play. And in spirit of that, uh, maybe put a sign office above your atelier and see how the teachers react. Uh, you yeah, know? That's, that's, that's a good If advice. you can't change the space, you can always change the name. And maybe that can open up the discussion about what this yeah. space really is. Eh? It's all yours to play with. I mean, it starts right here. It's not when you leave this door, but architecture starts right here. Thomas? No, I don't know uh, what it all is of needs, toch? Everything or nothing, that's uh, what I say to, the, to say to myself. Uh, I would say embrace the not knowing. And I still plea for a lot of poetry in architecture, in the approach. Thank you very much. Javier? Yes, uh, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, I, have, I have a last, last comment. Uh, Johannes has been generous, generous enough to give us uh, some of the copies of, some copies of his uh, book, The Athens Recorder. So I have a little question for Johannes. Do you want to tell us something about the book before, before everybody goes and grab it? Maybe it makes sense. It's an uh, it's an imaginary uh, um, diary, if you like, of some I think eight days, uh, uh, and in total is seventeen chapters. It says day one, chapter one. Um, uh, so there's there's chapters in it. The chapters have uh, different topics or different themes, if you like. It's all about the city of Athens, uh, uh, mainly in the public the public space of the city, and. Um, why is it Athens? Athens was the city where I, for the first time as a kid, understood what a city could be. And uh, um, let's exaggerate and say I fell in love with it, with the filthiness, with the bigness, with the, with the, with the historic things and uh, um, the rudeness of it. Uh, so that the, the book, in a way, is an uh, order, uh, uh, a love letter to the city. Um, don't look at it uh, in one turn because you get very depressed. Uh, use it as an atlas uh, uh, and I have to say one thing about my work my work is not use it for your own work look look for the things that you want to know and uh, uh, steal from it copy from it go ahead make your own work from it thanks thanks uh, Johannes it's an A3 by the way so just speaking of formats yeah. I had the impression when I heard it that I was holding an A3 for the whole evening uh, thanks very much for uh, your contribution today I, one of the thoughts that I get when I, after listening to this or, or to you, is that probably this Kunz week is something very weak in our curriculum. We should make it stronger. I think that you should probably contribute with more uh, to the uh, uh, design appreciation, sorry, the, the appreciation of art amongst uh, all of us, and especially the students. I appreciate very much the idea that architecture can leak, and that's okay, and that's good point about it. And I really live with the doubt, why are we surrounded by orange? I work with the author of this, and I actually must ask him tomorrow the reason why we are surrounded by orange, <laughs> and why it keeps being rejected all the time. I, I mean, I would simply say that uh, something that also Lex said, maybe if this was gray, we would be in, at ETH in Zurich, which is maybe not what we want here. But anyway, <laughs> that's something like to think about. Um, this is the last BK talks of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the year, not of the academic year. Um, the exhibition goes on until the 26th of uh, of January. By the way, Tariq, the last of the commenters, has a piece floating over there, and uh, we will come back on the 19th of January uh, with uh, with another BK talks about the BK timeline. We're going to look about the history or look at the history of TU Delft of the Faculty of Architecture. Uh, we're going to look, about the, uh, to look at the uh, famous graduates, or non-so-famous graduates, 
to their work, to their contribution to education, and how the curriculum has evolved, and uh, I think many other things. It will be, uh, it will be conducted, moderated by Dirk van der Heuvel, and we will speak about the work that has been led by Art Oxenar for quite some time already. Uh, for me, it's been a fascinating discovery to go down to the cellar with art and uh, actually try to understand what has happened uh, uh, in terms of education, design, and the way we see things since uh, the mid-19th century until the year 2000, in which the time lamp stops. The idea is not only to talk about the past, but actually to learn about what is it that we can do in the future. So, Happy New Year to everyone here and at home. See you very soon. Bye.